We have, um, we've had uh, vision and gift days over the last couple of weeks, and so far we've raised £39,000 towards our target of 50000 So praise God for that. Let's give him a big round of applause, shall we? We're giving thanks um, to God, but also to you. Thank you very much indeed for those who have given, and um, just that means that we can just um, get moving with some of these things that we'd love to do in, in developing this space for our guests and um, for all that God wants to bring in. So, Ed, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Rick. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, if you weren't here at the beginning of the service, then really warm welcome to St. Paul's today. And if you're new to the church, um, it'd be great to connect with you. Uh, and one way that you can get in touch and find out more about what's going on in the life of the church is by grabbing one of those blue connect cards, which were in the, the back of the seats in front of you. And just pop your name and your details in on there and put them in the box at the back of church. And we'll be in touch to let you know more about the life of the church. And make sure you get along to the newcomers evening, which is tomorrow. So that's uh, all of that. Now we're going to read uh, from Ephesians chapter 6. So if you'd like to turn to page 1111 in the church Bibles or um, whatever it is, if you're looking it up on your own Bible or your Bible app, then I'll give you a moment to turn to that. But as we, as we just find our places in, in, uh, in Ephesians, um, we're starting a new series today. Uh, we're starting a new series called Nuclear Families, as, as Rick said. Uh, and uh, we are really, it connects really very much and very strongly with what we've been looking at with contagious um, Christianity and how we become a contagious Christian. Because what we'll find out is actually that our families and our family life is a huge part of the witness that we give to the world around us and indeed we are called by God to have families that model so much of what God is about that they are a witness to the world so this is not kind of right we've done how to share our faith with people around us and now we're going to move on to the next thing this is all really part of the same thing that God is doing amongst us where he's calling us to bring our whole lives into his uh, into his sphere of, of, uh, uh, of sovereignty and uh, lordship so that we might be witnesses to those around us. So nuclear families, let's read uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 2 and 3. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Honour your father and mother. I don't know if you would agree with this, but my sense is that we don't live in a culture which is very big on honour. We don't really have a, uh, a system of, of honour and shame. I mean, many people here will be from other cultures and other countries and would have grown up in a culture where there was much more of a strong emphasis on honour. And it's kind of opposite, I guess, of, of shame. Uh, and uh, so maybe that's the kind of the sense of the, the, the importance of honour and the way, the way that when it is lost and where shame is brought into a family or into a person's life, then a great bit of damage is done. We kind of don't have that same strong understanding. So when we read these words, we kind of think, what does honour mean? What is it all about? And, and so much so that, you know, you, you kind of think of, of, of a famous celebrity who, uh, a footballer is able to kind of be exposed and be shamed because of their private life. But their, their excuse is, well, don't judge me on that. I'm a good footballer. I'm a, I, you shouldn't kind of be interested in my private life. It's all about the success, the success on the field or the success in business or whatever. We don't have an honour culture. We have a, a success culture. And if you're successful, then even if some kind of terrible, lurid thing is exposed about your private life, then you kind of say, well, don't judge me, and you move on. That's the kind of culture we live in. So how are we to understand these verses that, that Paul gives us here in Ephesians, where honour is what is most paramount importance in our relationship with our parents, with our mother and father?
Well, what we need to understand is that this is of critical importance. These are the relationships that are most intimate to us. We need to grapple with it. Indeed, over the next couple of weeks, over the next three or four weeks, we're going to be looking at each of those relationships within the family unit. So uh, we're going to be looking at the relationship between a husband and a wife in a marriage, uh, and we're going to be looking at the relationship of a, a father to a child and a mother to a child over the coming weeks. But this week, it's all about our relationship to our parents, to the previous generation within our family. And we're calling it nuclear families because not only is it that kind of nuclear, the kind of the closest unit, the, the inner unit, if you like, of, um, of our relationships, but it's also because they have the propensity and the possibility of blowing up. Um, and so we want to avoid those kind of situations. We don't want to have families that blow up. We want to have families that are intimate, that are where there is uh, the, the presence of God in them. We want to have a Christian vision for family life. And we'll see over the weeks that it is radically different is radically different to what we might inherit or we might kind of imbibe or soak up from the world around us. And, and like I was saying, really, the way we relate to our family, to our spouse or to our child and to our parents is a very fundamental part of our Christian discipleship. And that means that we want to have that family life grounded in the life of God not kind of compartmentalising that part of, our, of who we are and, and thinking that our Christian discipleship is something just personal between us and God, but recognising that our family life needs to be grounded in the life of God. So we'll see over the coming weeks that marriage is a context for discipleship. And we'll learn about the, the way in which the roles of being a mother or a father are a context and a means for discipleship but before we go on to those relationships this week we're going to look at the way in which our relationships with our parents are a context for our discipleship not only is honor a problem for us in this western uh, society and in the culture that we live in we also look at particularly the role of older people in our society and in this country and we all realise that really we are up against something here if we want to honour them, if we really want to honour our parents. We are working again against the culture. We look at the way in which we live in a, in a, in a, in a culture that celebrates youth, that celebrates um, the, the, the latest thing. The, the, and young people are kind of pushing culture and pushing the, the innovation of new things. And so they're celebrated and they're lauded and they're lifted up. And as a corollary, old people, elderly people are marginalised, are dismissed from the public realm. How do we deal with that? You know, I was looking at some statistics which say that, that there's a huge amount of poverty uh, within the older um, community. Uh, you might know that... that, that that Shadwell has the highest rate of child poverty in the whole country. Somewhere around 60% of children live in, uh, in um, income-deprived homes in the immediate neighbour neighbourhood to where we are right now. But did you know that also Shadwell is the place in the country which has the highest rate of elderly poverty? So there are the most people, the most elderly people living in income-deprived families and homes is in Shadwell as well. It's, uh, it's somewhere around 59% uh, of, of elderly people living in this area are in income-deprived families. Over half, well over half. What are we doing as, as a community? What are we doing as people living here? in terms of the way that we look after our parents, how are we listening to scripture which tells us to honour our parents if those are the statistics. Now the reality of course is that many of us, our parents aren't living here. They're not actually in this neighbourhood. They might be living some completely different part of the country or quite likely for many of us on the other side of the world. So how do we take to heart these, these uh, verses, these words of Paul that we should honour them when they're geographically so far away. 
So let's get into this and find out what Paul is saying and why he's saying it. So Paul is, is picking up here one of the Ten Commandments. It's the first of the commandments to deal with our um, horizontal relationships. Having spent time in the first uh, half of the, of the Ten Commandments, uh, God is giving the way in which we are, the people of Israel are called to relate to him as God. And then this commandment, honour your parents, honour your father and your mother. This is the first of these, of these horizontal relationships. As we bring our relationship with God into the right uh, way, then we'll find that our relationships with people around us also are affected and we're called to bring those under the authority of God as well. And the way that we do that with our parents is by honouring them. And as Paul points out, this is the first of the commandments in the Ten Commandments, which has a promise connected with it, directly connected to it. Honour your father and, and mother so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So we're called to live out this commandment, this 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 way of relating to our parents and there's a very practical reason that, that, that we're given in the Ten Commandments and that Paul reiterates which is that it will go well with you uh, and you kind of think yeah that, that kind of makes sense actually <laughs> I think it, um, certainly if you're a child living with, with your parents you kind of think well um, I kind of know where my food comes from and, and I know where my clothes come from so yeah, I can see it's going to go well with me if I actually kind of respect them, if I look up to them and I maybe occasionally say thank you uh, for giving me all this stuff. So there's a very practical reason. Honour your parents, honour your father and your mother that it might go well with you. So you kind of think, yeah, that makes complete sense. But there's something kind of more, there's something more subtle which, which, we, which we're to understand about the way in which our relationship with our parents impacts our life and the life of a community. And that seems to be that the Bible says that um, having a, an attitude of respect and honour and wanting to care for our parents is not actually intuitive. It doesn't come naturally to everybody. And therefore it has to be stated, indeed, God states it in the Ten Commandments because he wants the people of Israel to be different. He wants them to stand out amongst the nations that are around so that they uh, show a different way of living. So that as a community they, they are organised differently, they're structured differently around the commandments of God, around the presence of God himself. And his presence permeating their community and their relationships, those nuclear relationships most importantly, will be a witness to uh, the surrounding nations, to the surrounding people. And that call on the nation of Israel to be different is no less needed today, is no less uh, powerful a message to us, the church, the people of God, today in the 21st century. The call to honour our parents is no less needed because it is no less radical and challenging a thing to do. We want to be different. We want to display something, a different way of, of relating to, uh, to our parents because that will be challenging to the world around us. And indeed, we will be blessed. It will, it will go well with us in the, in the, and that we might enjoy long life on the earth. So how does it work? How does it work at the different stages uh, of our lives? Well, the verse just before um, uh, where we started, so verse 1 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, really frames the way in which, when we're children, we should honour our parents. And verse 1 of chapter 6 tells us, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So when, we're, when you're a child, the primary way of honouring uh, your mother or your father is by obeying them, is by obedience. And so for us as, as parents, those of us who are parents in, in, in the room today, the, the kind of thing that we're trying to build into our children's life is a, an attitude of obedience and a kind of spirit of, of obedience, if you like. Not because we want them to be continually under our thumb, but because that is the best way for our children to grow in godliness. 
And that's why um, Paul uses this, this phrase, obey your parents in the Lord. And throughout the, 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 the passages that, that, that Paul is talking about, these practical relationships between a, um, a husband and a wife or between a, a child and a parent or between uh, um, a master and a slave, as he'll go on to as well, he's always using this phrase, in the Lord, of the Lord. And that's because we need to bring God into those, into those relationships. So for those of us who are parents, we're looking to have cultivated in our children's hearts an obedience. That is the way in which they will demonstrate honour to you as a parent. And it needs to be seasoned and balanced with the way in which we love them, the way in which we serve them, which is so much a part of parenthood. But honouring for a child is first and foremost about obedience, about recognising their authority over, the, over them and that you have that role to play in their life. So w- most of us aren't you know, young children anymore, but we are still the sons and daughters of parents. We still have parents. So do we obey our parents throughout the rest of our lives? Or is there actually kind of a a subtle development and evolution, if you like, of the way in which we live out this call to honour? And it seems to me that really as we become adults ourselves, and the Bible is very clear about the way in which you know, a, a child will grow up and they will leave. And if somebody's getting married, then that is, you know, all the more clear that you, will, you leave your parents and you leave the authority of, of them, in a sense, the, in your kind of relationship of, of obedience to them. And you come into a new married relationship and this becomes a new family unit. So then your relationship with your parents is inevitably going to change. But anyway, apart from that, as we grow up and become adults and have a a calling of our own to to play our part and to take responsibility for our actions in the world, then our relationship with our parents changes again and it's not a continual relationship of obedience in all things. And this might kind of, you know, we're touching on issues that we're we're all kind of thinking, how do I, how does it work in my family? How does it work for me? Um... Because I'm glad I'd said that, because there's definitely some situations where I, where I kind of feel like there's a bit of a push coming from my parents to kind of to do it a certain way or to act a certain way or to be under their, their kind of command still. But I, I feel a tension with that. Well, I do feel that, that, that we're called to sort of to subtly uh, and gradually over time reorientate ourselves with our parents, but there must be an expression of honour that runs through your relationship with your mother and your father. And as, a, as an adult, I would, um, I would suggest, I put it to you, that the way that you honour your parents, your, your mother and father, is by continuing to hold them in high regard, continuing to respect them as your parents, and by demonstrating kindness and care for them. And as the, we go through life and your parents become older, then the way in which you demonstrate honour through kindness and through care will need to become more practical uh, and, uh, I guess, more, more significant, a part of your own life as well. And that is really where I think the call of God here on our lives and the Christian vision for family life really begins to challenge the prevailing view within our culture would we really have that level of old person poverty in our country if we were taking to heart this call this responsibility on children to honour their parents it's a difficult one but I would suggest that over you know, the last few generations, the, 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 the kind of the default of being uh, in a posture of wanting to look after and to provide for our parents in their old age has been eroded. And it's much more uh, a, a sacrificial decision and a countercultural decision to decide to make that a big part of your life. 
It comes with all sorts of difficulties. How do you do that when you're a married couple or if you're actually you're a single person and therefore your resources are finite uh, and perhaps a bit smaller? The, the, the challenges are, I, I, I understand them. But I would say that over the last few generations in our country, there's been an erosion of that, of that posture of respecting and providing for the needs of our parents in their old age. And I think we as, as Christian disciples need to hear that message, honour your father and mother so it may go well with you. We need to hear it and we need to engage with it and ask the Lord how we can honour our parents wherever they're at in their own life right now. It's challenging, it's difficult. But we can remember that they've given us a lot. There's a legacy for those who live in a, and were brought up in a Christian home. And I know that's not all of us. Uh, and, I, and I know that it's, it's not the case for everybody. But for those who have Christian parents, there's so much to be thankful to the Lord for. And there's so much to thank them for. They have given us a legacy, if you like, of, uh, of knowing God's goodness in our lives. If we, I was brought up in a Christian home. And I feel the benefit of that every day. I feel that in terms of the way in which I parent, in the way in which I, 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 just, I live in the world. And that is something I'm, I'm so grateful for. But do I give expression to that in the way that I continue to honour them and give thanks for them? I feel challenged by these verses to do that more uh, in my life. We, the Bible talks about the way in which for those who love him, the Lord will demonstrate his goodness for a thousand generations. What an amazing opportunity. What an amazing thing to give thanks for if we have Christian parents that we can say, thank you, Lord, that there is a legacy in my life and that I pray will be passed through into my children, uh, into their life as well. So we can give thanks. We can celebrate those who uh, have brought us up in the Lord uh, and have acted the way that Paul describes, you know, uh, in verse 4, Fathers, bring them up, bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. If you received that kind of upbringing, I guess, you know, none of them are perfect. But if there was that characteristic to your upbringing, then give thanks to God for that. That's a, that's a wonderful blessing. The truth is, though, that, that not all of us had that kind of upbringing. Not all of us come from Christian homes. Not all of us come from homes in which parents took to heart the calling of the Lord to disciple their children, to, to, to love them, to teach them, to obey them in the Lord and to show them the, the, the grace of God in their relationship, in the way that they brought up their children. And therefore there'll be a, a negative impact for those of us who, who, were, who experienced that. There will be a, a negative impact for, for parents where there's been um, hardship or where there's been struggle. And of course, where there's been any kind of abuse or neglect, then that will be amplified and that will be more a struggle for you now as, as an adult. How do you take these words seriously if in fact you do not have good, uh, a good legacy from the way that you were parented. How do you honour your father and mother? Well, this is really where I think the gospel becomes absolutely paramount. And this is why Paul only gets to these verses at near the very end of his letter to the church in Ephesus. He spent the best part of his letter explaining what the gospel is all about explaining how radical it is, explaining how it gives you a whole new identity and that you're now wrapped up in Christ, that you have, you have a totally new identity. And only as a result of understanding what Jesus has done for you in giving you that new identity, that you have become a follower of Jesus and that everything that you were has changed, only then does Paul get on to kind of applying that to your life. So then the first four chapters are all about that. And then in, verse, in chapter four, at the beginning, he says, therefore, live up to the calling that you've received. Live up to 
the calling that you've received. You've got to understand what your calling is. As a child of God, as somebody that's been given a new life, before you can think about applying this to your life. I mean, anyway, even if you've got wonderful Christian parents, it's still hard to do this. But especially if you've experienced difficulty or or abuse or um, massive tension in your relationship with your parents, you need to understand your calling before you come to this. So you need to understand that you're a child of God. You need to understand you're not, if you're a Christian, you're not first and foremost a child of your mother and father. You're first and foremost a child of God. That's what the wonder of the gospel tells us. Think about the beginning of John's gospel. Um, John explains that to all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So if you are a Christian, you have God as your father. And that is the primary paradigm for you understanding what fatherhood is, what parenthood is, is God. And that's because your, your, your new identity is that you are a child of God. In a sense, some of the old is gone even. You've become a new creation. You are now a child of God. You, you, you weren't born of human decision into your Christian faith. It's that great kind of thing. You're not Christian because you were born in a Christian family or born in a Christian kind of christian type country. Um, like, like we say in the Alpha Course, any more than you're a hamburger if you were born in a McDonald's. You're not a Christian because you have Christian parents. You're not a Christian for any other reason that you have become a child of God. And that means that you have the Spirit of God living in you. And so Romans, Paul says there, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. How do you know you're a child of God? Well, the way in which you live in the knowledge of that adoption is because of the Holy Spirit living in you. And it's that which helps us to understand that God is our Father and he's lavished his love upon us. You know, 1 John chapter 3 says, How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So we have a new paradigm for understanding parenthood. As a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, it's God. He has become our Father. We have become His child through believing in Jesus. He has given us his spirit to live inside us and it's, us and it's the spirit that testifies with our spirit that we are God's children and so we know the love of God. He's lavished it upon us. We're called children of God. How wonderful that is. And that's why Paul's foundation for saying honour your parents, respect them, Look after them. Display to them your thankfulness, your care. It's first of all our calling that we've been called into, um, into this relationship with God through Jesus. And secondly, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, this command to, to honour our parents flows out of something that comes beforehand. And if you just work backwards a little bit, then into chapter 5 of Ephesians, you'll see in verse 18, um, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. So Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. And that be filled means 
go on being filled day by day. Be continually filled with the Spirit, not once as a one-off event, but continually in your life, ask with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And what happens after that is that there are a number of things that flow out of that being filled with the Spirit. And so the things that are written there in verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and songs with the Spirit, giving thanks to God the Father for everything. That's not where it ends though. That's not where this being filled with the Spirit ends. Verse 21, that that should really say submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's no break with what's gone before. This is not a new idea to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ that's in isolation. We do it because we're filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Be filled with the Spirit, obeying your parents and the Lord, for that is right. So the foundation for the way that we think about this whole area of our life is, first of all, our calling, and secondly, our dependence upon the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And those two things are absolutely crucial. If you are to apply this principle to honour your parents into your life. You kind of think, this, there's so much that I struggle with, with, with how to apply this. I don't know how to do it. I don't, I, I don't know the ins and outs of how to provide for elderly parents or, uh, or how to begin to refashion a relationship that has been lost for ages, for years it starts with your identity as a Christian. Your identity is one that's been made alive with Christ and filled with the Spirit. And there you will find the resources that you need. Now some relationships are so broken that it might not be possible to mend them. But in many, we can pray for wisdom to know how to relate to our parents, how to honour them how to respect them, to provide for them, to show kindness and care for them in practical ways. But it starts with discipleship, with learning from God. My, my father is a wonderful godly man and um, he's shown at me and my, my brothers and sisters so much uh, about God's love um, in the way that he has fathered us. Uh, but last year, he went through a, a, a very difficult time with his, with his own mental health. And um, in the autumn of last year, he experienced a severe mental breakdown and uh, a clinical depression that, that um, left him uh, hospitalized for uh, an, an quite a long period of time. And it came out of nowhere. And it hit us like a bolt out of the blue because he's always been like super stable, super there for other people. Uh, and suddenly he was utterly incapacitated. And the relationship with, between me and my father at that point in a way was totally transformed because I'd always looked to him as somebody that would give me wisdom, that would give me guidance that would, uh, that would give me counsel, that I could look to for helpful advice. That's the way, that's, you know, that's the way he'd always been with me. Suddenly, the responsibility was all the other direction. And to pull round and to help my mum and to be there a whole lot more, travelling down to Cardiff on the train um, every few days, it was a massive challenge. But what I sensed as I uh, went through that kind of season, and, and we give thanks to the Lord because my, my father has made a great recovery, uh, and he's, um, he's not, no longer in, uh, in, in hospital. He's back at home, and he's, in a sense, rewiring himself so that he can learn how to live sustainably. Um, but, but, but my sense is, as I experienced that kind of massive change was that the the way in which I worked out this principle 
of honoring my parents, of honoring my father in this instance, had to be based on the presence of God in my life. The, the, the understanding that I am primarily a child of God and it's that which gives me security, not my relationship to any human people, uh, indeed my father. And secondly, that I needed the presence of God, his Holy Spirit in me to help me to give what was needed by my father at that time. To honour him where he felt like all of his honour had been uh, stolen away. The ministry that I had in that time and that my other uh, siblings had was to honour him because he is our father. Not because at that particular time we thought that you know, he was all together in his life. We honoured him. And that gave me an insight into the wonder of living differently. Of living as a disciple of Jesus and applying it to each of those relationships in our life, within our families. Our families are a context for the gospel. They're, a, if you like, they're a, you know, a little greenhouse. They're a, a little microclimate of their own in which the presence of God will be able to be shown to the world around us. As we go through these series, are our nuclear families going to be ones where we kind of feel like we're going to lift up the little lever and push the button because <clears throat> we get so aggravated at times? Let's just see this thing explode. Or are they going to be characterized by an intimacy that is founded on God's love? That is characterized by knowing that we're a child of God and that we are continually asking for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to come to a time of communion and as we do so, we, we understand afresh what it means to be a child of God. What it, what it means to have the spirit of sonship within us, testifying that we are God's children because we see the love that the Father has lavished upon us. That's what communion is all about. God the Father has lavished his love upon us in Christ. that we might be children of God. And that is what we are. Amen. Rick.